Hello, and thank you for joining today's presentation entitled Crop Planning for Yield and Product productivity. This webinar was sponsored by the Risk Management Agency. Before we get started, I would like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. I've taken a screenshot here to show you an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right-hand corner. You will have the ability to ask questions using your questions pane. Simply type in your questions and click send. We will not be using the raise hand feature. We will pause about halfway through the presentation for questions and we'll do a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. If we can't get to all of your questions during the webinar, we will answer them offline in an email or phone call. There will be a short survey after the webinar. Please help us help you by completing the survey. And here's a little bit about Michael O'Gorman, our presenter. Michael studied organic farming in the late 60s and early 70s and pioneered the locavore movement in the 1980s. After managing three of the nation's largest organic farms for almost 40 years, he put down his shovel and started the Farmer Veteran Coalition. And now, without further ado, here is Michael. After the second session of um, the mathematics of, of profitable vegetable farming. Um, today we're going to focus, I'm going to, first of all today we're going to do a little bit of review of what we went through last, last week and segue into today's uh, focus which is going to be on crop planning. Crop planning is a real key. Um, over the last eight years veterans have consistently talked to us about how to get started in vegetable production and getting started and figuring out what to plant is the number one question. And so we're going to really focus on how do you make those decisions and how do you come up with an organized farm plan. The equation we started out last week on was yield times your price minus your cost equals your profit. That's what you need at the end of the day. Your yield is what you produce per area. Your price is what you sell or, or uh, credit your farm, your, your product at, your, your cost is the cost of producing it, including your time, your profit is what is left over. Yield, once again, is what you produce per area. Productivity is what you produce per time. Increasing yield increases income. Increasing productivity reduces cost. As we mentioned, everything in your entire career is going to be weighing these two things against each other and making your decisions on how to go forward to have enough yield and to be profitable and have enough productivity to be profitable. Yield starts with the optimum growth for each plant. We reviewed these things. Uh, you've got to have the right seed, the right light, the right conditions, the right water, the right temperature, the right fertility. Everything's got to be in place. We went through some deterrence to optimal growth, but the yield starts with every individual plant is, is, is grown correctly. Turning optimal plants into optimal yields, you take that ideal plant growth, you figure out how to space it within a row, you figure out how many rows you're going to have in your area, in your acre, and then you also consider how long that crop's going to be in the ground. So you're multiplying your ideal plant times the amount of space you're using times the amount of time you're using that space. Finding your ideal plant population, you do that by maximizing the number of plants without in any way reducing the optimal growth or creating an unacceptable loss of productivity. We talked about a number of examples of this but essentially we'll go through a lot more today. Those are always the things you weigh. How do I get the most plants, uh, but at what cost is it going to be to get that, and do I make some compromises and make it easier to cultivate those uh, plants and make it easier to spray those plants, make it easier to get them in and out of the field. And we talked about three more equations when you look at how you're planning your farm. The first these, all these issues are 
help you increase the amount of repetitions, the amount of times, the amount of crops you can have in your acreage during your season. And the first is anything you can do to reduce the amount of time between seeding or transplanting and your first harvest. That's called days to harvest. So that's a key number. It's a key thing you need to learn from year to year and information you need to gather. The second thing you need to do is see if and how you can lengthen the duration of the harvest. That's the time from your first harvest of a, of a crop to the last harvest before you decide to turn it in. And finally, you want to reduce the turnaround. That is the dead time between the completion of one harvest and the seeding or transplanting of the next. And we looked at different ways that we could reduce that amount of time and get you back in the ground faster. We got our, any questions popped up early? If we've got some, we can start out on our, our review left over from last week, and if not, we'll go um, straight forward into the um, crop planning session. Uh, thank you, Michael. I have not had any questions so far. So we can continue. Okay, so what I want to share today is a story about a place called Grandma's Garden. Um, this is a farm that I ran into when I was a young man. Uh, I think I was 26. I was maybe in my fifth year of farming. I'd gone down to the uh, homestead area south of Miami to farm in the winter. I had a, a relative of a friend who had access to 128 acres on the um, major thoroughfare and was told that it never freezes uh, um, it never freezes in Homestead. So if you ever look up when it snowed on Miami Beach, um, you'll see that uh, it snowed, uh, it froze when I was there. The second year, we lost a lot of money, but um, uh, this story isn't about that. This story is about Grandma's Garden. So driving down to Florida, one of my first explorations, I came across a vegetable stand that was called Grandma's Garden that said 35 fresh vegetables vegetables picked daily. And to a young man entering vegetable production, that seemed incredible. This was, you got to think, the days before CSAs and the days uh, before farmers growing 50 and 60 and 70 varieties. So I want to look at Grandma's Garden and how I studied Grandma's Garden and figured out what they did and how they worked to reduce, to make that the simplest possible way to produce the most amount of vegetables and how I was able to carry that for the rest of my career. And every time I went into farming, every time I went into a new crop or a new field or took on a new piece of property, I used these same elements. So I want to walk through these. The first is called product line extension. What I realized after an hour or two of going through the vegetable stand at Grandma's Garden was that they were counting different types of peppers, different types of squash, different types of beans, that they really only had six or seven different crops producing those 35 vegetables that they had for sale. So product line is important because it is the way you add variety without adding any complication to your crop planning. And at the same time, it is a real plus in your market. If you're going to bring bell peppers into a market, if you have a restaurant customer that wants bell peppers or a supermarket that wants to buy bell peppers from you or a roadside stand or CSAs, you want as many different bell peppers as you can produce. And it's very easy to produce multiple varieties at once. So the first thing you've got to think of is product line extension. This also carries into large-scale wholesale production. So it's something you carry with you at whatever level you are producing. Any buyer wants to go to one supplier for their peppers for as long a season as they can. And so this is what product line extension is. The second thing I realized coming from that is that you could streamline your plantings in a way that simplifies everything you do. And so I came up with this idea. Of, and I've recommended to a number of beginning farmers. And the first time I did this at a uh, 
public event a few years ago, the beginning farmers thought this was total blasphemy because everybody wants plant diversification and uh, lots of different things. But my suggestion was that beginning farmers try to do too many things. And so I suggested something really unique. Now, this doesn't mean this is exactly what you have to limit yourself to. This is just a concept and a concept that I want to share with you. And that's that if you have three seasons, if you are in most of the growing regions of the country, you have three seasons. You have a spring season of cool weather crops, then you have a, a summer season of warm weather crops, which can't have frost on either end of them, and then you again have a fall season of cool weather crops. You have three seasons. If you started out and just planted two crop families per season, but had practice product line extension within that family. So you, if you started in the spring with eight varieties of lettuce and six varieties of potatoes, and then you went in the summer and had five varieties of squash and eight of tomatoes, and then you went in the fall and you had uh, a half dozen brassicas um, and uh, uh, different um, bunching greens, you can have 35 to 40 different crops for sale uh, during the course of the year, but you only have two row spacings for your entire season. You only have two ways to set up your cultivation in your spring. you only dealing with two methods of harvest at a single time. You only have two temperatures and humidity that your product has to be stored at. That is really, really important and really difficult when you have multiple too many different crops. Everything of these 35 to 40 different um, crops that you have to sell can fit into two different packing boxes. Those packing boxes, each of them can have the same um, footprint on a pallet, usually seven for a pallet. One will be shorter, one will be deeper, but you're dealing with two types of packing boxes. And most importantly, you're simplifying and being able to plant in blocks, in larger blocks, to make simpler rotations from one crop family to another as you plan your, your um, crop planting that goes through the season. So in this concept, the first thing we want to talk about is the row spacing. And this is also something I've been able to carry with me. If we, uh, when I was younger through most of the country, um, um, before um, GMO corn um, and soybeans, most, most vegetables, most uh, large seeded vegetables like uh, sweet corn, peas, beans, and even if you had special plates for squash, um, were planted at 30 inch rows similar to how people planted um, corn or beans. Um, the equipment was set up. There's also a lot of configurations with 36 inch row spacing and in California most things are on a 40 inch row spacing which meant that they are raised beds in California and that's uh, 40 inch from center to center with a top on the bed of about 26 inches across. So. The reason why people do this is so that they can farm either, with either two or four or multiple row equipment and keep two rows between the centers of each tractor tire. So what I'm suggesting as you go into farming and you're in your early and your beginning and even your middle and even through your entire career, when you organize your farm, you look at keeping just two row spacings. One is those single row spacings where you're planting every row, and these are some of the crops that you would do that on. Um, sweet corn, determinate tomatoes that are uh, um, left on the ground, possibly on plastic mulch or planted in areas like California where, uh, where they grow processing tomatoes or determinate tomatoes for fresh tomato market, but you don't need to stake them and tie them peppers, eggplant, summer squash, 
sometimes summer squash gets a little big in this configuration, particularly on the narrower rows. So sometimes you could go every other row or you could go plant two rows and skip a row and plant two rows and skip a row so that you have a you're picking from the side on each summer squash. Green beans would be every row. Um, okra, okra could be every every row or every other row. I could have put it the other way. It's been a while since I've gone okra. And um, uh, pickling cucumbers could go under this um, configuration. Summer crops that you plant every other row would be your determinate tomatoes, the tomatoes that you staked up, your cherry tomatoes, your early girls, your your um, heirloom tomatoes, your um, better boys and uh, round tomatoes and um, hybrid tomatoes that you stake up. And um, this, this should say indeterminate tomatoes. Sorry, that's a mistake. But the tomatoes that you're going to be harvesting for um, multiple weeks, and uh, those would be planted every other row. Melons, they need to vine out. You would be planting those every other row. Winter squash and pumpkins, and also uh, cucumbers, slicing cucumbers that, that you either uh, are trellising every other row, and you just need extra room to get in between the trellises, or you're letting them vine. They would be, they would be in this uh, configuration. So I want to talk a little bit then about succession planting. Succession planting is how do you take a single vegetable crop and extend it for as long a season as possible when one crop of that vegetable is going to, uh, the harvest is going to begin to decline at a certain point. How do you schedule a second planting to have the right overlap with the first planting and um, a third planting and a fourth planting. To get into most markets, uh, wholesale markets, restaurants, even to bring people to a vegetable stand or to produce for um, direct markets, uh, farmers markets, you want to have crops come in and you want to have them stay in for as long a period of time. This is also part of the simplification plan and the focus on just the multiple crops at any given time. So the first uh, planting I'm uh, going to talk about is squash. And we also want to issue the, the whole idea of product line extension. So I showed a picture of five squash. That's a straight neck yellow squash, real popular in the south. The still the most popular squash in the southern tier of the U.S. is the crookneck squash. Uh, that's a, a green zucchini, not the best one. That's a um, yellow patty pan. That's the sunburst variety, extremely popular on the market. That's uh, a uh, dark green patty pan, and um, I'm not sure the the short round squash, uh, green squash. But these are all five examples of summer squash. Uh, if I were to pick five, I would go with the zucchini being the predominant squash, and then uh, the crookneck and the uh, sunburst, and maybe a little bit of the uh, green patty pan, and the gold zucchini. The gold zucchini is really beautiful, but it's a little delicate. Talk to your buyers. Who are you going to sell your product to, whether it's a customer, whether it's a market, whether it's a multiple different restaurants, find out what are the squashes they want, find out what size they want them at. Uh, that might determine um, um, some of the varietal choices, the varieties that are favor the smaller varieties. Um, it will determine your frequency of harvest. So talk to your buyers ahead of time, line up the varieties and the percentages and the distribution of the different varieties that you want. But once you've figured out your varieties and how much your assets asset um, assigning to each of the five varieties. The next thing you want to do is figure out the frequency of your planting. So I would suggest with squash, for example, that your first planting goes in in May, May 1st, May 10th. It could be earlier if you're farther south. It could be later if you're farther north. Um, 
but the, your first planting would take you probably uh, seven to even eight weeks before you're harvesting. Um, and your second planting, if you went uh, five weeks later, it would be faster to come in, and it would, and it would, uh, the difference between the first planting and the second planting would be more like four weeks. And you do a third planting, so it again uh, is going into the fall, and um, it'll spread. The harvest will spread out a little bit farther. So I can uh, put these, post these dates up uh, when we put our, um, um, when we put this topic up on the website. But the idea is you take that same planting, you plant them about a month apart, you prepare, you're capable of harvesting each field uh, up to 20 times every other day for up to six weeks. There's a little bit of overlap. If your prices aren't good, if your market's diminished, if there's something happening with your quality, you can abandon it after four weeks. If it's really good, you can keep one your first harvest and your second harvest simultaneous and your second harvest and your third harvest simultaneous and um, and adjust your volume um, and be prepared to uh, um, cash in if the demand is there. Another fun thing for succession planting is sweet corn. Sweet corn is everybody's favorite thing to grow in the summer and uh, eat in the summer. It's a classic uh, farm stand, fresh market fair. Um, it's grown all over the country in every time zone. Um, and nothing says uh, farm in summer like sweet corn. So I came up with a thing, uh, with a plan when I was growing sweet corn uh, by utilizing the, the different types of corn. Um, in, in when I did fresh market corn, there was white corn and yellow corn. Now bicolored corn has taken over the market. Um, bicolored corn is a uh, hybrid, but it has both yellow and white corn in it. So it's, it's good in the way that you don't have to worry about separating your white corn from your yellow corn. And it seems to be the, uh, some of the better varieties out there. So I would say what you do is you find three varieties of sweet corn. And in the marketplace of the seed companies, they'll be called early season, mid-season, and late season. And that means the early season means that it's going to be shorter days. It's going to come in a little bit faster. Uh, maybe you know, I, it's been a little bit since I looked at that, but probably about 70 days. Uh, maybe as little as 63, 70 days to 70 days. The mid-season is going to be another week longer, and the longer season, the later season is going to be another week longer. What you do is you plant one fifth of the field with early season corn about 10 to 14 days before the optimal time of planting corn. Now, how do you find the optimal time of planting corn? Watch your neighbors. Uh, neighbors that are planting corn for grain uh, and for the uh, aren't looking for when the best time for the market is. They're looking for when is the best time to get the corn in, to get the best stand, to get the out of the field before it's too cold, before it's too rainy, and before the pest get too uh, um, difficult for the corn production. So they are honing in on when is that optimum time for planting corn. In many regions, that's about 45 days before the solstice, uh, somewhere around May 10th. So once you identify when is that optimum time for planting corn, take your early corn and go 10 to 14 days earlier and get that in. You're risking 20% of your corn. You don't want to plant when you know it's going to frost, but if it's likely not to frost and it's likely to work, I would go and, and risk 20% of my field and get some early corn in. That second planting, go back to the corn, and that second planting is going to be, you're going to plant all three varieties that day. So if you're going to plant 100 rows of corn, you plant 20 rows of, of early corn on the first planting, 
On the second planting, you go another 20 rows of early, another 20 rows of mid-season, and another 20 rows of late season. Ten days later, you just plant the late season, 20 rows of that. So what you've ended up doing is you will have a field of sweet corn will produce well for about 10 days. There'll be a little that come in later uh, that you may well go in and clean out of the field, but you're going to have about 10 days. So to what you want is each planting to come in about a week apart, have just a few days of overlap, and a new fresh field coming in. In this way, you're planting three times, and you're harvesting fresh corn for about six weeks. You have the least amount of setup, the least amount of work going into your planting. You're getting your harvest done before the uh, moth pressure and the caterpillar pressure gets really bad in the late fall. And you've got six weeks of sweet corn um, to sell. Uh, this is something you could do uh, with and maintain a 40-hour job. You could harvest and sell your corn on the weekend with the family. Um, you could find a buyer. You could cultivate it during the season. You could irrigate it if you need to. Um, you could take care of your sweet corn and, and have five acres or 10 acres or even 20 acres of sweet corn and maintain a day job because of the simplicity uh, around it and the fact that most people are going to be looking for sweet corn to buy on the weekend. I'm going to go through one more crop, and then we're going to open up to questions. And this is uh, my favorite crop, um, well, and that's the lettuce crop. And the reason why I like lettuce is for beginning farmers is because it is in such demand, and it's a perfect crop for bringing to restaurants. And I think restaurants are real um, uh, underutilized outlets for people looking at jumping into vegetable production. Uh, you could find, you could grow mixed varietal lettuces, such as these types of varieties here. You could be picking them, uh, all lettuces sold in 24 count. You could be picking them at a baby size, which is a, a small size, maybe just three to four weeks after transplanting a lettuce. You could grow them mid-size, which is, um, um, maybe just six weeks after, or five weeks after transplanting, depending on the weather, and then you could grow them full size, uh, the type you see in the supermarket with a um, band around them, and um, uh, for sending home to the family, but uh, and maybe take a little longer. You can also plant many different varieties, so this is another thing you should talk to your buyers about. But um, before the days of salad mix became so prolific and uh, dominated the packaged salad and the uh, restaurant trade, uh, chefs wanted 24 counts of lettuce, of different color lettuces, different types of lettuce like the red oak, uh, green oak, Lola Rosa, the bib lettuce, the butter lettuce, um, um, even frise, the endive. They like these different um, head lettuces. They're held together. Um, they're, the leaves aren't separated. They're held together by the, uh, the, the butt of the plant that holds the head lettuce, the head together as you harvest. So you don't have to have the same food safety standards. You could um, rinse them off and cool them off. It's assumed that the um, restaurant has to, has to go forward to, to um, wash and prepare the salad. They're able to prepare their own salads. Um, that's something that chefs are looking at these days because the packaged salads from California and the baby salad industry that I was so involved in is uh, really putting out the same identical salad. Every company is doing the same mix. And um, it's um, not real exciting to a lot of them. So this is a, something also because of the short season it takes to grow a lettuce and if your summer is not too hot, you could. This is a crop that could be grown through all three of your of your seasons. It could be grown through the spring, all the way through the summer, and into the fall. So you could grow either four or uh, you could grow four types of lettuce: two greens and two reds, and pack them together in a 24 count. 
uh, and make a really beautiful presentation to our restaurant. You could grow them 24 of each variety separately and uh, sell them that way. You could grow even more varieties and have uh, more options for your chefs. And, and finally, this type of um, lettuce production that you'll be doing from transplant, not from direct seeding, uh, grow in your greenhouse and put out, you'll really be able to control mathematically exactly how many lettuce you're putting out, how many boxes that's going to create, uh, how much you have to sell. Uh, you're really having a handle on your lettuce. You're being able to uh, a very competitive crop with weeds. You're able to plant one bed multiple times during the year and work it up. Your um, uh, the the time between the uh, plantings will be um, reduced. Your turnaround time will be very short. Um, so this is a really good uh, crop for succession planting, and um, one that I think is uh, is very good for for. Uh, um, vegetable farmers around the country. Another reason why it's good is because the cost of shipping these products from California and Arizona uh, get higher and higher and uh, the support for local produce. So it's got a good market support for it and it's something you could really build uh, your farm around. So these are the three crops I chose to talk about. Um, I'd like to see if we stop here with some questions and uh, uh, carry forward. Thank you, Michael. Um, we do have a question from Patrick. Uh, he's considering a high tunnel project. He asks, do you have a list of the various vegetables as options? Hi, Patrick. I think the lettuce, I think varietal lettuces are perfect for a high tunnel. Um, it depends uh, where you are and how hot it is in the summer. Um, lettuces. The high tunnel could keep the lettuces protected from on the cold side of the season. Um, they could keep it protected from excessive rain and uh, uh, a certain amount of, of frost and cold damage. Um, it may be too hot in the summer. Uh, you may want to switch to tomatoes. Um, tomatoes in a high tunnel, um, I think, takes a little bit of strategy to figure out the um, the right way to make the most off of tomatoes. I've seen people, um, a lot of people go into the high tunnels to try to bring tomatoes on early. Now that's an interesting concept because you can get them um, in early, but most money in tomatoes on the commercial market and even on the local market is made on two ends of the season, May and June, in November and December. And so uh, that's when uh, there's a lack of tomatoes for import. It's when California rains have come in California the last day of, the, of October, the first day of November. Um, the demand for tomatoes for the holidays goes way up. On the front end, it's just too early for most regions to grow tomatoes. So what I suggest for tomatoes in a high tunnel is planting them a little bit late in your summer so that you begin your harvest um, just as the days are cooling down, maybe in um, uh, middle to late September or 1st of October. And if you are, even say you're going to harvest the 1st of October and you're staking tomatoes and you want to get a good six or eight weeks of tomatoes, then you have your tomatoes carrying right through the Thanksgiving season when you're going to see big spikes in, in um, um, prices, uh, your plants are going to be at their healthiest. You're not going to need an excessive amount of cost to heat your high tunnel or to protect it from cold weather. Um, you're still going to be taking advantage of natural daylight. And um, so you need some strategy involved. I would say maybe lettuces going early, um, obviously bunching greens, but those can also be outside. Um, and um, tomatoes coming out of it, those are just a couple examples. Thank you. Um, now we have a question from Emmeline. 
I am curious about how to market your farm products to restaurants. You need to go meet them. You need to go meet them in the off season. Um, if you're farming already, um, that helps. Um, it's uh, hard to get in a door. It's also the cardinal sin in in farming, though I wouldn't. Um, you got to take a risk sometimes. But they say the cardinal sin is the you know the doors open. They open once, and so to to get in, take take on a someone that wants to buy from you and not be able to produce uh, makes it a little harder to go back to them. But um, I would say you need to go to the restaurants and and buy from them. Go there and eat. Ask to talk to the chef. Bring him a card. You know, find a quiet time in the early afternoon. Uh, see if you could talk to the chef, the produce buyer, the sous chef. Say you're going into vegetable production. Um, we know there's a lot of demand for local vegetables. What can I produce for you? What can what can I do? Um, they love talking to farmers and uh, sharing their ideas. So I think that uh, you just need to knock on the doors and, uh, in many cases, the, the back door of the restaurant. Thank you. Um, now, James asks, do you have suggestions for pricing if marketing to farm-to-fork restaurants? The, I mean, the, 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 the right price is the, what's the most you can get off of anything. Um, you don't want to price yourself. You don't want to push your prices to the point that um, um, you go there someday and the buyer says, oh, by the way, I found somebody that's um, a little less. Uh, than you are. Um, uh, you want to um, start out maybe a little lower than if you're starting out than you want to be later. Um, the uh, Buyers are more forgiving um, when you're not gouging them than when you are gouging them. Um, what you want is loyalty. A buyer is going to reward you for two things. They're going to reward you for your consistent quality. They're re going to reward you for your for your candor and frankness. If you have any problems or you see a future uh, down the week, or that you're not going to have the product, um, you also have to be real lo loyal to that buyer. Once you um, become dealing with them, you can't drop them and go look for somebody else who's going to offer you 50 cents more a box. You got to build on that relationship. Over time, you'll be able to add more crops. You'll be able to uh, um, nudge up your price. You'll be able to um, move more volume, and you'll be able to um, use your contact, your uh, reputation with that buyer to get other buyers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom asks, if I'm just starting out, how do I determine how much of each to plant? The very first thing is um, you're limited by how much ground you have um, and, and what your capacity is to, to manage it and to harvest it. If it's just you, um, if it's just you and a partner and, um, um, or you're in many cases that's where, where people are starting out, then I would think that you need to look at that as your, um, as your limiting factor. Um, one of the reasons why I like simplifying the planting schedule is so you spend less time off trying to sell the product and more time on the farm learning to grow it, getting it in the box, and, and getting it uh, a little bit of time getting it delivered. Um, I think that the simpler your, uh, your growing um, your crop planting is, the fewer items you're growing, um, you can actually um, handle more than you can when you're doing too many different things. You've got to remember that every time you're moving from one crop to another with your cultivator and have to readjust your, 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 um, your cultivator shovels, every time you have to readjust uh, how you're going to spray something, how you're going to fertilize this something, how you're going to seed something, that's a lot of lost time. So what you want is to um, keep it simple and um, 
uh, do a little less than you think you can at first, and um, and and trial and error. Okay, these are all good questions. Um, another one from David: After you harvest it early in mid corn, did you pl plant something else there? The latter two late corn plantings. Um, it depends how long your season is, David. Uh, corn's going to go, you know, you're going to be harvesting that corn. And if you're lucky in July and August, uh, June and July into August, uh, maybe up to Labor Day, depending where you are. Um, corn's leaving a, a huge stock and a lot of plant matter. That's the thing when we talk about turnaround, how uh, fast you can get a, um, a crop turned in and begin the decomposition and be adequately broke down that you could use that ground again. Um, doubtful, unless you had some uh, really good equipment um, that you could do that very quickly following a corn crop. Um, one way you could do it is to uh, uh, cut your corn um, and uh, um, use old equipment called a, called a binder, ways that you could take your corn out uh, take your shots of corn out of the field and, and use that, but um, uh, it's going to be a while. That's going to—that's the type of plant matter that that's going to be harder to break down and get back in real quick. Okay, um, we have Chris who asks, "What about planting to rotate crops between seasons?" So what? Um, then we get. So what about crop rotation from season to season? Um, so I talked about the three seasons. Um, you're going to have a difficult time rotating within a season, but you can rotate between the seasons. Um, so what you're going to have to do is once you begin schedule, once you, once you choose what you want to grow, um, and there's a, I'll talk a little bit about what you choose want to grow. Um, there is a little trick to this that I recommend to people. And uh, I recommend you go to your county ag department. In every county in the United States, they'll have an ag department, and they'll have a website, and I'll tell you what are the 10 top crops in that county. And that'll tell you a lot about what can grow in your area. Um, now, you may see that uh, we're here in Yolo County, California. 90% uh, of the country's ketchup is grown in Yolo County. This is processing tomato paradise. Um, it smells like uh, pizza when you drive down the road and um, um, another, it's already, the trucks are everywhere already. And it continues for several months. Um, so. What does that tell me? Well, it tells me I can grow heirloom tomatoes as well. I can grow cherry tomatoes. I could grow, if I could grow tomatoes, I could grow eggplant. I could grow peppers. So once you decide what you can grow, then you can decide when can you grow it. That's another thing determined. Uh, I would go to your nearest meteorological station not necessarily your closest by miles. Sometimes it's your closest by temperature types. Sometimes uh, you're in a microclimate and um, your closest station might be up the hill or down the hill, but um, 10 miles away there's something that's just like where you're farming. And get those records and find out when it's safe to plant something. Um, you have a lot of ways to extend a season. Uh, cool weather crops are more forgiving. Um, once you get your crops, uh, figure out what you're going to grow, then you have to start mapping them out and uh, map them out on a calendar to show when do you want to plant, when do you want that first harvest, that days to harvest, what is the duration of my harvest, and how much turnaround time. And then you can see when is that field open. And if that field opens for a second crop in the summer, then go for it. If it doesn't open for a crop in the summer, um, go for it in the early fall, in the fall season. But you have to map this out. We'll, we'll work on some mapping of this in, a, in a, another session. Um, but you have, to, you have to 
map this out um, on a calendar uh, where you lay out. You could even use an Excel spreadsheet and just write your uh, weeks on the top and uh, and enter when your plantings are, uh, when you expect your first harvest, how long it goes, and um, and you're, that's also creating an availability for you that eventually you're going to be able to take to your marketplace ahead of time and say, this is what I'm going to have for sale this year. Thank you. Okay, John asks, how many acres do you think the beginning organic farmer should start with to get profitable in a reasonable amount of time growing typical commercial crops? Good question, John. Um, I'm, I really think 10 or 15 acres, I mean, that's, that there's no single answer to this because not everyone's going to have 10 or 15 acres. But if you have 10 or 15 acres of good farmland, if you had it um, with water and irrigation, um, you can make a good living off of that. Um, we see some um, veterans we work with here in California with 15 acres. Um, bringing in um, three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, that's taken them a number of years to get there, um, and uh, they have a good climate here. So maybe a nine, eight or nine month season. But uh, these farmers take the winter off, and um, um, they're making money. They're paying their workers well. Um, I think a ten to fifteen acres is a really, really good sized farm. And it can um, be fairly simple and not an enormous income the first year uh, and can build up from there. Okay, thank you, Michael. We have a lot of questions coming up. Um, another one, Tom has asked, um, is it best to find my customers before I plant or do I plant and then look for customers for all that I've planted? It depends what your what customers you're looking for, um, Tom. But if you want a supermarket, if you have a local Whole Foods that uh, or a Sprouts, and say that there any um, of the um, supermarket chains are interested in supporting local farmers, uh, veterans that can use the Homegrown by Heroes label are finding um, doors opening that might not have opened otherwise. Um, we have. Um, people like the military produce group that are begging for um, veterans to grow product that they can uh, distribute um, on the uh, commissaries, the military commissaries. So once I would definitely speak to your buyers ahead of time, uh, particularly if it's your first year. I would definitely look, at, uh, look around. Um, I would talk to other farmers, um, find people who have tried different things, uh, uh, tried and failed is uh, important information. Tried and succeeded is important information. Um, but I would I would spend a lot of time asking around and uh, um, ahead of time. Okay, um, we have one from Glenn. He says, "Can you recommend good resources for yield estimates for vegetable crops for market gardens, high tunnel production?" Um, good question, Glenn. All really good questions. The Knox Vegetable Handbook is an excellent uh, book for yields. Um, if it's an item such as a head lettuce, if it's something or a bunching green, if it's something that you count, uh, that you could tie back directly to how many plants you're putting out. Um, if it's something that you're yielding per pound, such as a, um, a steak cucumber or a steak tomato or relying on multiple harvests, uh, a good crop um, for, um, um, for high value for low acreage, for example, is basil. How many times are you going to be able to pick your basil and still have a high quality? Um, so um, I, there's different reference guides to these things. Uh, some of them give uh, um, numbers in terms of um, linear feet, most of them give them in acres. Um, 
it's good just to set some targets and like I talked last week, it's it's a learning curve. Once you set that target and learn uh, and get one crop, you got um, you know one piece of data collected, and then you start with your next one and you adjust and you see what makes it go up from there. Okay, thank you. Um, Don asks, Michael, I have four acres to grow vegetables on. Is that enough? How much acreage did you actually have in vegetables at one time? You mentioned growing sweet corn on top of a job. How many acres can one person handle on sweet corn? Well, I think four acres could be handled in sweet corn. Uh, with a, I think that's a really good question. I think that that would be an excellent thing. If you're going to handle a day job, I would look for something like sweet corn. Um, I would look for something that um, could be harvested um, you know, Saturdays and sun. You you know you're gonna have to work during your your summer, but um, if you like you said your your partner, your wife, your uh, your kids, uh, you know whoever you can cajole to go out there. Um, in that four acres, in my scenario of sweet corn or three plantings, it would be um, um, six weeks of planting. You'd be bringing in uh, just about two thirds of an acre a week over six weeks and um, th that's really doable. That's really doable. Okay, thank you Michael. We'll take a couple more, we'll do a couple more questions. Um, Ken asks, what's your recommendation on soil sampling to amend soil? I recommend soil sampling so I would see who's your local laboratory. Um, if you don't have a local one, um, um, there's ones that you could send your uh, soil out to. Um, more important than soil sampling, first of all, um, is I would go to the uh, um, USDA, NRCS, Natural Resources, uh, uh, Natural Resource Conservation, and and look for the soil map of your farm. Um, in the 1930s, all the soil uh, um, agricultural soil in the United States was mapped and soil is real specific and finding out your soil type and what recommendations they give about your soil type is going to be extremely important and then you want to start your analysis to be able to see how you need if you need to uh, adjust your pH if you need if you're really devoid of organic matter uh, where your phosphorus and your potassium uh, and nitrogen is always going to be low. You got to figure out ways to um, add nitrogen to the vegetables that need it, and come up with a plan. But um, um, sampling, soil sampling before any fertility plan um, is uh, is paramount and very very important. Okay, thank you. Here's a maybe a, a follow up question: Have you ever tried cover crops with vegetable crops? Always. I would never grow them without them. The cover crops are absolutely a sensible form of fertilizer. There is no single, there is no other form of fertilizer that's going to be more important um, to vegetable production than cover cropping. The one thing I say very differently though from many people is a lot of people say go out and cover crop everything every year and um, and I would say, why? You know, if you if you want to get into half of your field or part of your field early to plant those summer those spring crops, and your cover crops uh, one inch tall, what do you gain? Um, unless you have soil that uh, is on a slope and maybe a road over the winter, but I would rather uh, plan your soil crop as part your cover crop as part of your rotation and take as much as half of your farm every year, but um, plant it so the, the, that half of your farm is the um, last half that you'll get into and the, and the cover crop can, um, can grow as tall and produce as much uh, biomass as possible before, before you turn it in. Okay. Um, we have one more from Katie. Um, well, we have several more, but we'll answer one more. Um, asking, how can I deal with pest and succession plantings? Example, squash bugs, harlequin bugs. 
Well, I'm going to have to study up on squash bugs because squash bugs are really an issue in the United States east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, I don't know why they go that direction and they're not a, really a um, what we call an agroeconomic pest on the west coast. We have plenty of other things. Um, but the, the, the latest um, uh, round, you know, there's uh, in organic production, if you want to go uh, conventional, there's lots of things that could be treated. If you want to go organic, the, um, the latest things on the market are the things to look for because every year they're improving, they're finding uh, new combinations of uh, things you can go after to, um, to kill the bugs. A lot of um, organic treatments are different uh, versions of um, pyrethroids that have been available in different configurations over the year. They get uh, on the market and get replaced by one that's better. Uh, they're also dealing with um, um, keeping them um, on the uh, uh, approved list in organic production. So you got to look at that. And if you're conventional, there's lots of things you could do for bugs. Uh, that's one of the uh, um, the trade-offs there in that in in that market. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to take on another question? One more. These are great. Okay. Um, Don is asking, were you plowing your fields? What farm equipment should a vegetable grower plan on buying? I would think that um, it depends where you are, Don, but um, I, we're going to do another session definitely on, on farm equipment for your vegetable farm. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see is that um, um, beginning farmers look at too big of tractors and too big equipment. You're, you need to plow your field at most once, maybe twice a year. Uh, that's going to be two days out of the year you're going to need a tractor that's large enough to do that. The rest of the year you're going to need a tractor a fraction of that size. So consider is there a neighbor that can come in and do that for you? Is there a service, somebody that you can pay to do that for you? Um, is there uh, some place that you could borrow the equipment and the, and, the, um, and the tractor to do it yourself? So I would look at those options. Um, we'll do a, a lot more lengthy talk about different um, farm equipment and how the, your selection of equipment ties into um, how you plan and lay out your farm. Um, but there's a lot of uh, uh, options between the um, BCS tractors that a lot of people are using on smaller acreage and doing real well with, and uh, um, and smaller size tractors with um, um, the different Im implement configurations. Okay, thank you. And it looks like we're about to run out of time. So um, please know that if there are any more questions that have not been answered, we will uh, request take them down and try and answer them offline. So thank you, Michael. Um, and a big thanks to our audience for participating in this webinar. Uh, please remember to take this short survey at the end. It's very short. Um, and so it'll really help us to help you. Um, and if you have any more questions or need more help, you can contact us at support at farmvetco.org. And thank you again.